Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Movie Libertas podcast hosted on Logan for Liberty. How are you all doing? I hope you are all having a fantastic day. I hope you are out there going to pick up some snacks for movies. I hope you're going out to the movies. I hope you're watching some interesting stuff. This is episode four. Um, I did an introduction uh, for my podcast talking about what it's going to be, especially in contrast with the rest of the channel, Logan for Liberty. Um, I did a review on Joker after I saw it, and it was still fresh in my mind. Um, and I did a review on Doom Annihilation, the basically straight-to-streaming, straight-to-DVD movie. Uh, basically a B-movie. Today, I am doing Pet Cemetery, the 2019 remake. Now, this movie did not do very good with... Well, okay, before I go in, um, the first quarter or first half of this will not contain any spoilers. I can't give you an exact mark, but I'm going to give some generalized thoughts about Pet Cemetery 2019, my reaction to it, my thoughts about it, and the overall feeling I had while watching it. I will tell you when I start talking about spoilers. So you can click off the video then if you want to. But this movie's been out for a while. Um, I rented it at Redbox. So it's it's a movie that you should be able to uh, see. And it's been out long enough, but I will give you a a spoiler warning before I go to go into any spoilers. Sorry, I was looking something up as I was trying to talk. So the movie didn't do very good among critics. So if we go to the Rotten Tomatoes score, 57% Rotten Tomatoes rating, which is the aggregate score out of uh, 261 reviews. But the audience score is even worse. It's uh, 34%. That's out of 3,000 ratings. Um, I will compare how I feel about the movie to that particular rating, what those people feel the movie, how they feel the movie is, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, well, first, let me get into it. My first exposure to Pet Cemetery was Pet Cemetery 2. I was a young kid, and that movie scared the shit out of me when I was little. It was on TV... And my dad was watching it, and I sat down on the couch and watched it with my dad. And then from there, uh, I went to the first Pet Cemetery. I, I really started loving horror movies at a young age. Horror movies, suspense, thrillers, mysteries, at a young age. But from Pet Cemetery 2, eventually I went to Pet Cemetery, maybe a year later or so, when I was a little older. And then from there, I read... Pet Cemetery, and I enjoyed it. When I saw the trailer for this movie, I, I I made a goal over the last two years to go out and see movies in the movie theater. Now I could have I might have a podcast talking about um, why I like going to the movie theaters and sort of maybe give my response to the criticisms of people going to movie theaters because I know there's specific people out there. Who do not like movie theaters. They have bad experiences at movie theaters. But that's just not me. Anyway, I saw the trailer for Pet Cemetery, And I was like, wow. This looks awesome. I want to go see this in theaters. But I didn't see it in theaters. Unfortunately. Because I, 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 not only do I want to see more movies in theaters. I want to see horror movies. Thrillers. Mysteries. Suspense movies in movie theaters. So far... When I was younger, uh, Ring 2, I saw the Ring 2 in theaters. I saw Lights Out in theaters. I saw Us in theaters. I saw A Quiet Place in theaters. And I saw Halloween 2018 in theaters. So far, those are the only movies that could be considered, you know, in the scary movie broad umbrella, underneath the broad umbrella of scary movies that I've seen in theaters. Those are the only five. I wanted to also see Overlord, but I didn't get the chance to do that. 
Anyway, um, so it came out in Redbox, and I was like, okay, I'm going to go watch this movie because I wanted to see it in theaters. And I decided to look at the reviews, and I saw that on Rotten Tomatoes, the aggregate score for both the audience and critics wasn't, it wasn't good. I mean, people didn't like it. And fair enough, when you make, when you do a remake, some people go in and for nostalgic reasons, they don't enjoy the remake as much as they do the original. And then there was, in general, horror movies or scary movies don't do very good in, among critics. When I watched this movie, though, I enjoyed it. I went in expecting to not like it because both the critics and the audience agreed that this movie wasn't very good. But when I was watching it, it I had fun. The movie had a, a kind of a bleak or gloomy undertone to it. But in the movie had a bleak ending, I'll tell you that much. But I didn't leave the theater feeling depressed or, or unhappy or miserable or dispirited. I just said the same thing with four different words, basically. Like, I pulled out the thesaurus. And there's something special about movies that can be kind of gloomy or brooding. And then they could end in a, a dark way, right? But you don't leave the movie feeling depressed. There's a few movies with that kind of ending that don't make me feel so... The Thing. We feel kind of... You know, that that's a pretty dark ending. Spoiler alert, The Thing has been out since the 80s. So, um, sorry, but The Thing, the end of Thing, The Thing. Almost every character's dead besides two. Sorry, every character is dead besides two. The entire base is being burnt down. The last two characters don't trust each other, and you know the last two characters are probably going to freeze to death. Or one of them is going to, you know, happen to be the Vang and then attack. Or whatever. That had a pretty dark ending. The first Halloween movie, John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween, two John Carpenter films. Anyway, uh, John Carpenter's 1978 Halloween had a pretty dark ending. Everybody's dead besides the babysitter and the, the two kids that she was babysitting. And this killer won't go down. I'm talking about the context within the context of only Halloween 1978. Not the... What, what it became. Not the legacy that it, you know, sort of fostered with all its sequels and the several reboots and the remakes. <laughs> I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about that movie alone had a bleak ending. But I didn't feel depressed watching those two movies. And there's various others, but this is about Pet Cemetery. This movie had a dark ending, but it was... It, I didn't feel depressed. And I liked that. And I genuinely cared about the characters. Because there's something that happens. And the married couple, I... You're, Anytime I see a married couple in movies, I, I automatically root for them. Especially if they have kids. I just... And I, I don't mean, like, throwaway dialogue or, you know, some throwaway plot element. Like in the first Alien vs. Predator movie where this character, who we barely know, is talking to our main character. And she's like, do I, or he's like, do I need to show you a picture of my kids? I'm not talking about a terrible throwaway line like that. I'm talking about we actually get to know this couple... See, they're dynamic, they're both intelligent, they both want the best for their kids, they're starting a new life, you want the best for them, you obviously don't want to see kids die, naturally. So, you feel for them, and when stuff happens to them, you're just, you know, you, you have this feeling, you're thinking to yourself, I just, I want them... You kind of have an apathy for them. You feel concerned. You want them to do good. You don't want to see their relationship and their life falter in any way. You, you know, you just want them to rejuvenate their relationship and just get past everything that's going on and have a happy life. And that's why I like good, scary movies because, or any movie in general, when you care about the character, 
you want to see them do well. I love those types of movies. And this movie, Pet Cemetery 2019, did that for me. And there's not a lot of movies that do that for me. Uh, 28 Days Later, I cared about the care. Oh, uh, I mean, I'll do reviews for those movies later on. So to get into spoiler territory. Um, oh, before I do that. John Lithgow. Lithgow? I don't know how you pronounce it. Lithgow? Lithgow? Anyway, you know what I'm talking about. The old man. I love him in this movie. I love J John Lithgow. I'm just going to say Lithgow. I love John Lithgow when he's in serious roles. He's been in, you know, a few comedies and whatnot. He was in uh, Santa Claus the movie. He was in both Daddy's Home movies. He was Pitch Perfect. Um, what else was he in? Leap Year, I think. He, he, oh, he was also in a movie called Orange County, which was the first movie I ever saw John Lithgow in, Orange County. I believe it was Orange County. Let me, let me see real quick. Uh, was he in Orange County? <whistles> Sorry about this. I should, yeah, he was in Orange County. He played Bud, which was the dad of the main character. Was, I mean, that was kind of a comedy. It was more like a... Yeah, no, it was a comedy film. It was... That's a weird comedy film. Anyway. I like him when he's in serious roles. Like... Interstellar. I thought he was freaking great in that movie. Interstellar, one of my favorite movies. And I thought he was great in this movie. I love it when he's in serious roles. I, I just can't get enough of it. So now to go into spoiler alerts. Warning, there will be spoilers. This, so click off now. So the thing I was talking about when the couple goes through something that sort of changes, you know, their relationship, their dynamic. Their daughter, Ellie, played by Haiti or Jetty G. Lawrence or something like that. I don't know. She's she's pretty talented and she she play we we all know the basic story of pet cemetery uh you bury something or somebody who has died in that cemetery they come back but their soul is kind of corrupted which has this overall kind of existential and metaphysical theme of dead is dead which i find interesting but she dies and the movie does a fake out because in the original Pet Cemetery, the boy originally is going to die, or dies. But this movie did a fake out. There is a scene where you're like, oh god, the boy's going to die. But they fake you out, and it turns out it's the girl who dies. And that was when their marriage, uh, Luis Creed and uh, Rachel Creed's marriage kind of... Like, their marriage is fine, but... They're... <sighs> okay, so... Their marriage, it's not necessarily, um, faltered or, um, damaged by any sense. But she ends up going to her parents' house and he stays at the house because previously in the film he brought back Ellie's pet cat who died before. And, you know, the cat obviously became malicious, evil. Um, in tandem with, you know, being buried in the pet cemetery, which is, you know, spelt wrong. That's not important. But after the daughter dies, you know, they have their, like, little funeral type thing. And they bury her. Um, Rachel goes to her parents' house. She takes the son. But she calls Luis because she wants Luis to come, you know, come be with her because she needs his comfort. Their son is having nightmares which plays into the whole supernatural element of this movie. And Luis has other plans. The dad has other plans. Because Ju or Judd, who's played by John Lithgow, you know, showed them the cemetery. And that's how you know they brought back the cat. He digs up his daughter, brings her to the graveyard, and then obviously she comes back, but very malicious, very creepy looking. 
And she looks dead. And that's what I like about this. Like, she looks dead. So I thought that whole uh, dynamic was interesting. And then eventually, uh, Rachel comes back because she doesn't want to be alone. Their son's having nightmares. Again, that plays into the whole supernatural element. Um, there's there's a character that dies earlier in the movie because our main character, Louise Creed, he is a uh, an ER surgeon, I think, and this, somebody dies on his table. And his son, through one of his nightmares, learns the name of the person that died at the beginning of the movie that Louise was trying to save. So, of course, that creeps Rachel out, the mother, because she's like, well, you know, he's saying his name, blah, blah, blah. She comes back and she sees Ellie. She's alive. So that freaks her the fuck out because she she doesn't even know about the cemetery at all. She didn't know that they were... She didn't know about the cat necessarily. I think she knew that the cat was dead, but she never saw the cat actually dead. So she didn't understand. So it freaked her out. But of course, Ellie, when she came back, just like most things that come back because essentially the soil is corrupted. That's the story. Um, it, it corrupted by the Wendigo. You know, with ancient Native American stuff. That's not really touched upon in this movie. She's malicious. She's evil. Her soul is corrupted. That or something else came... I, I don't know. So that shit just hits the fan. And to spoil the ending... Well, no, I'm not going to spoil it. I'm not going to spoil the ending that much. Sorry, this is a really off-the-cuff review. I just watched it. Um, Typically, I want my reviews to be more structured, but... I just, this movie, I just felt like I had to start talking about it right away. This, well, was there anything in this movie? So let me talk about the five things that I expect from a, a movie to be good. Did I personally enjoy this movie? Yes. And the elements that I enjoyed was I enjoyed the existential and metaphysical themes about life and death. Because it is existential, because it's about human existence. And then uh, it has a metaphysical theme, like af the afterlife, what happens after you die. The soul, what is the soul, is there a soul, can it be corrupted. And then it, it actually has um, themes and ethics. Is it morally okay to resurrect something that is dead? Especially if it's motivated by a reason that is only within your own self-interest but not within the self-interest of the world I mean not really within your own self-interest are you being short-sighted because it's not within your self-interest to bring something dead back to life and then have the consequences of that whether it be the malicious person who was resurrected the your wife not knowing about this particular cemetery and its effects the way society and the world would look if they discovered that you resurrected your daughter in a cemetery the social consequences the personal consequences and then the consequences that will be caused from the person you resurrected that's all interesting to me I really liked that. And I know that was, you know, touched upon in the other pet cemeteries. I like the other pet cemeteries. And I like the story. Which is why I liked this movie. It was updated. It had actors who I felt were better in their roles. Would I recommend this movie to you if you were at home, you want to watch a scary movie with your significant other or with some friends? Yeah, I'd say watch this movie. Maybe there's some things you can laugh at. Maybe you can actually... Maybe you'll actually feel fear. And there wasn't that many fake-out jump scares in this movie. Which I really like, because I hate fake-out jump scares. Like, you have one scene, and then the next scene, a toast, toast is ejecting from the toaster, right? You know, fake-out scenes like that, where they're false jump scares, they're not earned well. Or it's a quiet scene and then, then there's a loud noise. I hate fake out jump scares. I don't hate them. It's just they feel cheap. Would I want to rewatch this movie? Yeah, I will probably rewatch this movie and I'll probably do a, a more in-depth review and analysis about this movie. Were the flaws distracting? To be honest, I was, I was so into this movie watching it. Expecting to not like it. 
because of the reviews. And I didn't notice any glaring flaws or things that I didn't like. Because I thought the pacing was pretty good. I didn't have any issues with the pacing. The story flowed the way I wanted it to. So I wasn't distracted by anything bad about the movie. I'm sure I'm sure I could find something bad about the movie. And would I add this movie to my collection? Yeah, probably if it come, I'll probably pick it up on Blu-ray and DVD or digital. And you know, put it in my sleeve. It's not a movie that I want to own like the case and the physical copy of to take space. It's something that I would put in my book of, you know, DVD sleeves. I I think the only movies that I actually the only stuff I own actual physical copies of, meaning I own the DVD and the case and the, the label, the cover and all that stuff, is the first six seasons of Supernatural, the first two seasons of Bates Motel, the first two seasons of The Walking Dead, um, the Star Wars, the original trilogy, um, Star Wars Episode 7 and Episode 8, I haven't gotten the prequel cool trilogy yet, I'm about to, um... Uh, us, I, I'm, for us, I'm still deciding whether or not I want to get rid of the case and just keep the, the DVD and the Blu-ray. Shazam, again, still deciding, but it has a holographic sort of changes from your perspective, depending on your perspective cover, which I like. Um, 2001 Space Odyssey, Interstellar, Alien, Aliens, The Thing, 28 Days Later, Children of Men, Black Hawk Down. Batman Begins, The Dark Knight, The Dark Knight Rises, Overlord, First Man, and Halloween 2018, as well as Halloween 1978 are movies I own the physical... Those, those are all what I own the physical copy, meaning I have the disc and I have the case. And I don't keep most of my cases because they take up a lot of space. So Pet Cemetery is probably not something I'd keep the case to because it takes up a lot of space. I'd put it in a sleeve, but it's something I'd want to own the physical copy of. So yeah, I, I'd probably add it to my collection of, of movies. You know, my sort of, you know, let's take this case, let's go, whatever. I didn't hate this movie, and I, I don't dislike the movie as much as some of the reviewers do, the critics and the audience. I enjoyed it far more than they did. Like, what kind of score... Would I have expected this movie to have on Rotten Tomatoes if I watched it and didn't read any of the reviews or the aggregate score? I would have expected it to at least have uh, maybe a 60% critics rating and then a 70% audience score. Because this movie wasn't boring. I was enthralled through the movie. I felt some of the suspense. I felt for the characters. And it made me think about the ethics of, should we resurrect the dead? Should we prolong life? Should we prevent death? As in, completely stop death altogether. Like, like should we extend the human life an extra 100 years? Should the average human life be 160 years instead of 70, 80, around that range? Those are all questions I was thinking about, and I didn't see any major flaws in this movie. You should watch this movie. I don't have much to say right now, other than go watch this movie. The 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 gore was great. It was brutal. I felt like I really liked these characters. Go see this movie. I mean, that's really all I can say right now. Sorry this review's crappy, but... I'm still thinking about it in my head, and there's nothing about this movie that I hate, and I'm dubious about why certain people hate it, or disliked it, or didn't enjoy it. I don't know, I thought the actors were fantastic. The guy who played the main character, Jason Clark, I thought he nailed the role. He has this look of like, he, he can look depressed. He can look like he's going through some shit. That's just the look he has. Like his demeanor, his face displays almost perfectly stress and and hurt. Which is I don't know if I've seen him in have I seen other movies with him in it? Yeah, actually he was in First Man. I saw him in First Man. 
Because I, I mentioned that movie. I didn't see uh, the... Yeah, no, that's the only movie... Zero Dark Thirty. Those are the only movies I've seen him in. Um, I don't know if I've seen him on any TV shows or not. That's not important. Um, I already mentioned how I thought John Lithgow was perfect for this role. The child actors. Uh, Jetty Lawrence and um, Lucas were fantastic. And the wife, played by Amy Semetz, I think that's how you pronounce her name. The girl who played Rachel. I thought she nailed the role. I thought she was like... She's like... She, she was the perfect wife in a movie, almost. And I felt like she actually cared about the main character. There was the chemistry between the two main characters that I really enjoyed. I, it felt like they were a real married couple, but not the married couple like, Oh, once you get married, it all goes to shit type of married couple. But the married couple of like, I'm going to try. We're going to raise our kids together. And we're going to get through the tough shit because I really care about you. She felt like that type of wife. And I loved it. Because sometimes you hear about, like, couples whose kids die so it ruins their relationship, they get a divorce. Or you see in a movie that if something bad happens, you know, they'll blame the other one. Typically the wife blaming the husband. And we're supposed to feel bad for the husband. But this movie wasn't like that, which I fucking loved. God damn. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I just... This movie got me... Uh, got me excited. For, for that reason. I don't know. Um, she was an Alien Covenant. And Alien Covenant was alright. I wish it was more like Prometheus. She was good in that movie. Everybody in this movie, I think, was casted perfectly. Go watch this movie. I think it's fun. I don't think there's any real big major flaws. Maybe you think it's kind of dull. If that's the case, alright, maybe I understand. But I disagree. Go watch this movie. This was Movie Libertas. I might do a video analyzing some of the themes behind this movie. And that might be another episode. That might be a more solid edited video. Uh, so look forward to that. Um, I'm probably going to be doing a new episode really soon. Where I talk about what makes a great movie. Have a good one, guys. Focus, do you copy? Focus, do you copy? Find... Fine.